I'm okay. Yeah. Where are you? Are you in your Brooklyn? Okay. And you yes. are working from home all day, every day, dude, me too. I'm like, I feel like I'm averaging like 12 zooms a day. Oh yeah. No, that's been, it's been my number for sure. Cause it's, it, you work actually a lot harder, I think working from home, which is crazy, but yeah. Yeah. And then you don't really have like, obviously that separation of like, I'm now going to just chill. Like, I feel like because it's just like my workspace, I end up like working even later at night. Oh, hundred percent. Um, anyway, thank you so much for doing this with us and for being our keynote speaker. It's so exciting. Um, when I was doing kind of like all my research on like what to ask you, um, I was already a fan from afar. We've met one time, um, in person. I remember in LA two years ago, maybe, or last year. Yeah, I think it was last year. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. In in downtown when there was no COVID and everyone could just (laughs) live their lives. (laughs) Um, but but going even just on your social, on your Instagram and kind of all your stories and all the quotes that you're saving and obviously all the cover stories of Teen Vogue, um, I was just even more impressed, <laughs> uh, FYI, and became even more of a bigger fan of how much you've you know, accomplished in such a short amount of time. Um, and so I guess like my first question to you is, you know, as uh, editor in chief of Teen Vogue, um, how did you get into fashion and like, have you always been kind of into fashion? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I've always really been into fashion, but, um, not in the ways that I thought I would be. I think that a lot of the work that I really care about now, um, makes total sense because of my journey and where I've come from. I think that, a lot of my childhood was spent really loving arts and crafts. I used to go to um, a black senior citizen center with my grandmother all the time. And we would make quilts and rugs and pillows and all these fun things. And um, I remember just really liking to make things. And I didn't really connect the dots honestly until I was a lot older. Um, I, I remember, you know, when the Hills came out and that was a really big deal to me and I loved watching that. Um, you what know, was I, your favorite character? <laughs> I mean, honestly, the whole thing, when I, I, I recently rewatched it, um, you know, just cause you're like trying to find TV shows during this pandemic of like, what can I watch? Uh-huh. And I literally could not get past like the first three episodes. It was just so terrible. Like, you're just cringing. You're like, why did I like, well, what did it, what attracted you about that show when you were younger? Well, because it was a world that I really wanted to be part of, but I didn't really know anything about. And I didn't know anyone that was part of that world. And it just felt like so glamorous and so cool. And, you know, I can't believe she gets to like fly to New York for a night to do a shoot. Does not happen. It it literally was just, I think, a fantasy. For um, sure. And I mean, obviously now we know that the show was pretty much fake, but I think that, um, you know, I would sneak and watch Sex in the City or I was allowed to watch Girlfriends. And I think that, you know, a lot of those things from the show you realize now, like, okay, yeah, like Carrie would never have been able to afford that life or whatever. <laughs> I'm like, I always ask, like, how did she buy all these Fendi bags? Like, I Literally. just didn't even Manolo's understand. every other week. And no, like, totally. Totally. Here. No, no. Um, but I think a lot of it just felt like I wanted to be part of that world and, um, you know, obviously connects to a lot of what I do now is making sure that people feel inclusive included and feel like you know the industry is a lot more inclusive and that no matter where you come from in your background that you actually can be part of fashion yeah no it's i mean it's obviously shows and all the the work that you're doing obviously uh, and most prominently in all the you know teen vogue covers which is also incredible i wanted to ask like hearing you know you're the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, you know, one of the first uh, Black editors, does that still kind of like give you goosebumps or how does it make you feel now? And again, knowing, you know, your path and your journey. Um, honestly, I don't, I don't spend that much time thinking about it only because um, I think about that, you know, Michelle Obama quote where she, she talked about a couple of years ago, really making sure that she was the kind of person that when she got a seat at the table, that she really used that seat at the table to shake the table and to make change and not, um, and, and, and realizing that a lot of people, when they get to these really big positions, that all they do is really um, sit 
at that table and get really comfortable and just are really grateful and then don't really change anything. And I think about that a lot more so than the actual, um, you know, idea of me being in this role, because I, I think when I, you know, immediately got this role, it was like, okay, now I can do a lot of the things that I've been wanting to do. Um, beginning and end of every day, it's about the work and the change that needs to happen in the industry. And um, I, I also just don't really like to like wax poetically about myself. So <laughs> I'm not ever like sitting here like, oh my God, I'm so like, no. Um, I'm a regular girl from Wisconsin. I live in Brooklyn. I'm about my shit. And that's pretty much all you need to know about me. And I think that um, that is like the main the main thing that I'm always just, no matter what the position is, the goal is to make this industry more inclusive. Yeah, no. And it's, and it's, it's true. I think in, in the sense of like, you don't really like for me, sometimes I, I had to do like this uh, investor conference last week and I always just laugh after because I'm like, I'm, I'm the same way. You know, I was born in the Philippines. I didn't go to business school. I, you know, so I'm, when I'm talking to these investors, I just, again, after I'm ending the zoom call, I'm like, I, it just always trips me out. So that, that I'm, I don't know, in this position yeah. to like give feedback on whatever the state of marketing, et cetera. Um, Cause at the end of the day that, I mean, that's, that's exactly how I feel. I'm just like, I'm just a regular girl, man, <laughs> that just happened to be in this position, but that's yeah. super cool. And I think, you know, your attitude of being, I know, it's probably an overused word of being humble and just really knowing your roots again, continues to show through the work that you're, you're continuing to do, you know, obviously in the magazine and outside of the magazine, which we'll talk about in a second. I did see on your Instagram stories yesterday that you posted your husband still getting updates about you, which I was like, or on Google alert. I'm like, that's so cute. See, he, he still trips out about it as much as you do. I'm sure. It's so cool. He's he's (laughs) hilarious, but yeah, I mean, um, I just find that to be funny because we're like literally sitting next to each other. And I'm like, why are you reading this? <laughs> Lizzie, it's super cute. I think that's so cute. Um, so, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, being, you know, again, looking through your, your journey and just your career path and, you know, starting at, you know, Teen Vogue as, uh, as, as your first job and then obviously full circle. Now you're the editor in chief. How did you kind of like get past all the no's? Because I'm sure in your career, a lot of people were like, no, Lindsay, sorry. Like, I don't know, maybe, who knows? But how did you get past that? And and what keeps you going? I think a lot of it for me is that um, I really do spend a lot of time, like personally, I'm a person of faith and I spend a lot of time just praying and meditating on what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I think a lot of my childhood um, was spent really knowing that I couldn't just waste my life doing whatever and that I really had to find my purpose and find out what I was supposed to be doing. And and was that I, because of just like your, your, like your, your parents or grandparents, whoever around you that yeah, really I mean, instilled family, that in my family was always very vocal about, you know, we've, we've come so far and, um, you know, really talking about even just as, as black people, like, you know, we've come so far in our advancements and really taking that to the next level and, you know, making sure that you know that this life is a life of purpose and we don't want you. And my parents were always, you know, um, they never told me what to do. It was always like, we want to help you explore, like, and give you exposure to all these different things. And we want you to succeed, but like, we, you know, we really want you to find your purpose and your passion in life and really go after something. And I think for me, um, even when I've gotten no's and a lot of it, I really felt like, but I know the conviction in my heart of what I'm supposed to be doing and the things that I really need to do. Um, I think I also very early on in fashion felt extremely convicted that I wanted to do this because I knew I had something different to bring to the table than other people. And even though it wasn't welcomed, I knew that it would be needed. And I really felt like there was just always something to the tone of what I wanted to do that I think that people were always hesitant about, but then realized like, oh, wait, yeah, that's probably the direction that we should be going into. And I think um, it's, it's always going to be a push and pull because I think the fashion industry loves to like, say we're so progressive and 
we're doing all we're moving forward in all these ways but like right. a lot of it is extremely still so old school and yes you know of course racism but a lot of classism and elitism as well and i think that it's a lot of different things that people like myself have had to tackle and come against but i do think that internal conviction that i've had has really just kept me um and i i think that you know it's it's just different because I think that I look at so many people that I interned with or assisted uh, when I was an assistant and like we were all, you know, in the closet together or, um, you know, working on stories when I was younger. And I think that there's definitely, you know, people who just kind of want to be in fashion because they like clothes and they just want free clothes and they just want to like- Or go to, or go to parties. Or yeah, like whatever. Parties and that kind yeah. of thing. I and mean, there are people who are really in this because they really have a specific destiny and things that they really want to go after and do. And I just happen to be in that other bucket. So even when I've had no's, it was like, well, I'm not just doing this so I can get a jacket. So like, I'm going to keep pushing. And I think <laughs> when you're when you're a lot more intentional and thoughtful about, you know, your path in life, I think that that it just changes things. Yeah, no, that's incredible. And I guess like the day or the process of actually becoming the editor in chief, like, how was that? Like, did you have to even, did you have to pitch kind of like, this is my vision? This is what I want to do. This is like, um, yeah, so you're nodding your head. Yes. Like, yeah, no, I, I had to pitch a whole thing of like how I would change the magazine, all the things that I wanted to do. Um, you know, complete overhaul. I think for me, it was a very big picture of, you know, having spent time with the brand, both interning and assisting. I, I had a lot of ideas of ways in which I felt like the brand could immediately improve and then, you know, work on improving in the next couple of years. And um, I'm always like the most ambitious person in the room and have all of all of the ideas. <laughs> Um, so I think a lot of it has been, even from that time, you know, focusing and, and picking things in areas that I really feel like we have that niche audience and understanding of the community that we can talk to people in, in a very intimate way and focusing on those things because I think there's, you know, there's so many things that we always want to do, but it, it has been a lot of like focusing on like, who are we really and who are we really trying to talk to and how can we really make young people feel seen and heard even throughout a pandemic when we can't actually see people or have events like and I think that focusing on that has been um has been really interesting but honestly I, I love it when we're able to really connect with so many young people and um you know we had just had a fashion and media workshop over the weekend and it was a lot of fun to just be able to talk to young people about you know manifesting their dreams and whether they wanted to go into PR like, you know, Shiona talked about costume design or Gabby talked about like starting your own, starting your own brand and like, you know, branding yourself on social or Cami um, Celeste talked about, you know, the startup culture and, you know, trying to pitch yourself and how to go about that. I mean, it was, it was so fun to be able to sit with young people and, and hear their goals and the things that they're really excited about and the things that really you know are continuing to push them forward when they can't find a job or they can't you know their internship is canceled and there really isn't that much you know movement right now but just right. you know hear that all just made me even more enthusiastic and I, and I always you know that's what that's what we do this job for. No I mean honestly I, I can't stress enough how I've seen you know just the the vast um, number of people that you've, you know, featured, um, some I've never even, you know, heard of. So for me, as obviously I'm not your demo, I'm, I'm much older. Um, it's really refreshing just to see even, you know, I growing up never saw people like myself on magazines and, and honestly still very seldom see like, you know, a Filipino or Asian woman on the cover of magazine, unless they're like an actress or like, you know, at one point it was just like Lucy Liu everywhere because of Charlie's <laughs> I was going to say Lucy Liu probably. Yeah. yeah, she was like the only one, you know? Um, and, and it's still, people would be like, oh yeah, well you have Lucy Liu. And it's like, well, we're not even really from the same country. <laughs> but <laughs> how did you, I guess, like, you know, from the boardroom of just, again, pitching this idea of like, guys, this is how I want to change the magazine. This is my vision. Like, who are you, I guess, without being specific, like, pitching that to and from there to now like have you has it been the been the experience that you've that you envisioned when when you I guess from pitch to again this this you being in it for a couple of years now um has it unfolded the way that you envisioned 
Yeah, I mean, I I love so many of our covers for so many different reasons, and it is always such a journey, like literally a roller coaster ride every single time. But um, I think it's also because. I, I sometimes forget it's also because we're not just putting um, people on the cover that it's like, oh, they're in this movie in their sample size. So this is who we're putting on the cover because that is honestly traditionally how a lot of people and a lot of publications have been run of just like, oh, this person is in this new movie that's going to be big and put them on. signed with this company. So like do it and that's what we're doing. And there's so there there's so many conversations that go into who we put on covers that it's not even just a oh here's three people that are popular it, we literally talk about covers all the time of who we should feature because i think that especially because of my background i know how that can really affect things but also i think you realize that it affects other people's careers like to be able to put these people on a platform yes give them that voice etc like that is a really big responsibility like you 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 can put them on like you basically yeah yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely it's a very big responsibility and I, I take that really seriously and so every cover is always like okay so who are we getting behind Who's because next? i think similar to you know how i think a lot of people are understanding that like when you buy a, when you buy from a brand you are whether you believe it or not you are really directly saying that like you support that brand and you align with their values because you're supporting it financially and i think that it's a very similar thinking with us on a cover it's like if we're putting somebody on a cover i'm really saying that like we support this person they align with our values we we want to see them, you know, in bigger places and on bigger stages. And that's a really big endorsement from us because Absolutely. obviously, it, you know, it, I think it, the bar is just higher for us. Um, and so a lot of times um, it is, you know, just a lot of conversations with my team and, you know, then I'll, you know, go to Anna and kind of talk over it with her of who we're thinking and obviously making sure no one else is shooting them and kind of giving her the, the backstory of why we want these kinds of people. And moving from there, I have a ton of autonomy um, with the brand. And I think that we've been able to really carve out an incredible niche of obviously, you know, being for young people, but an incredibly uh, culturally relevant brand that it's not just young people reading it, which is really important to us, because I think a lot of the things that we talk about, it doesn't just affect young people. And I think that um, we really have just, you know, really wanted to maintain that we're staying in these conversations and and still being culturally relevant regardless yeah no and again i you know with with the numerous uh you know people and it's so diverse when i say diverse not just like the you know their skin color but just like their mediums and what they're doing what they're you know popular and quote unquote for um or or not like some of them have you know really small following but you're like mm -hmm. hey, they're doing something really amazing and 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 massive in a different way and i think you know i have to give you so much credit for that because as a you know brand myself like you know it always in the beginning kind of comes down to like oh how big is their falling like what is you know what are they doing et cetera, et cetera, to you know kind of make it sense on a business standpoint but i think it's been incredibly courageous for you to um think outside the box per se and outside the following um <laughs> and really you know put people on that that yeah are, are doing big things um you talked about you know values and you know when choosing the covers of uh, choosing people for the cover of teen vogue what are some of those values um that you know that within teen vogue and then maybe some that you yourself have really kind of you know, instilled in the brand since becoming the editor in chief? I mean, I think a big thing for me, um, the two biggest things for me is always some type of, you know, kindness and empathy, I think are, are needed in, in all these conversations. I think that um, I'm always looking for people that I think are having the conversations that need to be had that mainstream publications are probably too scared to <laughs> address. Um, honestly, like in the past two years that I've been over Teen Vogue, so many people have then put, you know, people that we've had on covers on their covers. And I'm not at all ever surprised that they're talent scouting from us because I think that we always have our finger on the pulse of who's doing what, but also like who's doing what that other people I think 
um, you know, are just a little bit hesitant about that isn't necessarily mass market. And I think that we always are really just trying to have those conversations that need to be had and then other people can kind of take it or leave it. Um, and I think they, I just really want it to always be a little bit unexpected. I don't, I don't want people to look at our content or our covers and be like, oh yeah, of course they put, you know, this person on the cover. Of course they did it this way. Like even, you know, even when we have featured people who have new music coming out, I'm always like, how can we push the line and, and do this a little bit differently? So like, I'm obsessed with Chloe and Holly's album and I love them. Um, but I really wanted to be like, okay, like I know we're not going to be the only people to shoot them because they are popular. So how can we do it differently? And we shot it with a drone um, and it turned out super, super cool. And the video was cool and all the photos were really amazing. They were like next to the pool and you can see like a shadow of the drone in some of them. Um, and I just like to push that line because I think that when you're in, I don't know, when you're in that zone of making content that's just too comfortable and um, expected, I think it, it it's just boring to me, but I think it's also boring to the reader. And I just think that we're continuously moving to a place in culture where people just don't want that kind of content anymore that they can't expect. Yeah, that's incredible. And, and you touched on, you know, other, um, I guess, magazines that, you know, kind of look to you guys for inspiration. Um, how, how do you think that those magazines can continue to evolve? And like, what would be like obviously you know they're looking to who did you guys feature can we use them but like how did how do we really make that that change i guess is my question more than like just the magazine being in the fashion industry um you know we've had a conversation about it and i don't want to shy away from it i want to continue to have this conversation with you as well um about like how about just that like how do we um retailers magazines myself um contribute to that change that that you guys have been kind of leading the path on for 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 quite some time yeah I think honestly the efforts are really about making sure that you're not just doing it to check a box but also that you're doing it in a way that is really inclusive of different kinds of um in, in different ways that aren't just, you know, the, the entry level way to get into the conversation. So I think like a, an easy example for this is everyone likes to talk about size inclusivity, but usually people, when they do something that is size inclusive, they only want to do something with someone who is a size 10 or 12 and has a flat stomach and that's still 5'10". And that's actually not size inclusive. That's you just being like, okay, we're going to get called out. So we need to feature someone who isn't sample size. Um, and I think for us, it's always like size inclusivity means we're shooting a girl who's a size 24. Right. And I think that every brand obviously has different, um, you know, I, I, I'm not expecting every single brand to be like, okay, we're going to make everything, you know, size inclusive, et cetera, because I would love for people to do that, but I know it's not going to happen overnight. I think it's just more so of the understanding of what is really size inclusive, what, it, what is really inclusive in all these conversations, because even with, you know, race and ethnicity, I think a lot of times people traditionally want to just say, okay, you know, we'll, we'll shoot the girl who is racially ambiguous and who has curly hair, or we'll shoot someone who's, you know, that they think is exotic, like an Anoke or something like that, but they don't really want to ever just shoot a black girl, like African American girl, or it, and it uh, kind of always has to be these like, oh, this is what is acceptable. And this is kind of what, what is, you know, exotic or urban or whatever. And I think that for me, it's like, you know, I really want, white people to understand that like you cannot just choose people who have a proximity to whiteness like that like you shouldn't be just choosing people because they make you feel comfortable you shouldn't be choosing people just because they are palatable to what you feel like is the okay version of inclusivity like you need to be challenging that definition because i think that um for us it's just it, it and for me personally, it can never just be this like dip your toe in it effort. Like if you're going to be inclusive, you have to be all in. Like you have to have skin in the game or you should get out the game. Because I think that it is a lot of people just kind of saying, okay, we're kind of going to do this. But it's like, well, if you really want to make an effort, I don't think people are saying like you need to do all this tomorrow. But I think even just letting readers 
followers, et cetera, know like this is something we care about. We're trying to improve. We're having these conversations even goes a long way because I do think that, you know, especially, you know, size inclusivity is such a good example of it because I think a lot of brands want to hop on that train, but it's like, well, you can't just do it for the girls who are 10 and 12. You got to do it for the girls who are 18 and 24 too. And I think they, you know, for us at Teen Vogue, it's like inclusivity is a lens in which we see everything. Everything we do, everything we touch is inclusive. It has to be holistic. And I think that is where brands are now, I think, seeing that they have gone wrong and not really and under, and, and not really understanding why, like, oh, we don't understand why people don't, you know, say certain things or they don't, they may, they may have called us out for things. And it's like, well, because you're not really going all in, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, and I guess for brands, you know, whether, you know, they were started 100 years, 100 years ago, or even 10 years ago, right, because so much has changed and continues to so rapidly. What would be your best advice to, to make sure that, you know, you talked about, you know, not just dipping your toes in. Um, but I think, too, it's, it's quite difficult, because there could be a brand or a retailer or whatever that I think could be not for everybody. I don't know if that makes sense, but Oh yeah, no, 100%. So I guess Like like Goop, like Goop isn't for everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I could see I could see that for sure. I'm like Goop sure. is like a niche, you know, they they sell like $17,000 earrings on Goop. So it's like, yeah, this isn't for everyone. I just think that it is you can be niche but still um inclusive in a lot of different efforts and I think that even if it is okay you're a really big brand and um you know this is our you know specific aesthetic aesthetic etc like I still feel like there are ways to be more inclusive that fit into that or you know finding certain brands in your larger group of brands that say this is really what we're going to commit to working on it with like these specific brands etc like I I just think it has to be it has to be part of something in the business plan, I think, for people. And I think they honestly, brands just have to realize that I think a couple of years ago, people would say, you know, I'll, I'll buy from this brand, even if I don't support them and I don't like them because this is a cute top. But like those days are dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. Absolutely. And I think that people have to understand that like that directly affects your numbers and your revenue. And so not getting on that train sooner than later is just not even a good business decision. I agree. And I think too, like, you know, you kind of, when you say you have your finger on the pulse, it's really because you have this direct contact with young people who are obviously going to be the, the, the lion's share of spend in the next call it, you know, 15, 20 years. And they, if not sooner, and they are really the ones forcing these conversations and are, I think to me, what's so inspiring are, the most inclusive. Um, and so I think, you know, for even Revolve, we've learned so much in the last couple of months and um, which I'd like to get into in a second and talking to you and what you're, you've started outside of, you know, Teen Vogue is Black and Fashion Council, um, where, you know, I'd love for you to obviously talk about it, but I think, you know, having, you know, that as well as I know there's also the 15% pledge, there's, you know, a, a few other organizations out there that's really holding brands accountable, I think is, is incredible. Um, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that and, and um, share with everybody kind of like, you know, the inspiration and how do you even have time to do this outside of what you do, <laughs> what you do at Teen Vogue? <laughs> um, honestly, I mean, it is a lot of work, but I will say um, if I don't do this kind of work, no one else will. So it, 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 I really don't have a choice. Um, because it's not like this is like a hobby. It's like, I have to do this because I know that if I don't do this, this work will not get done. And I think that, you know, a lot of the work that is done in fashion can be very like, let's, you know, have committees, let's do all these things, but not actually really help Mm -hmm. young black people. And I readily was like, I, we have to do this because I know this will actually help people and we actually will see progress and change. And so a lot of the thinking really came from um, when I did a piece of the cut about what it's like to be black in fashion and it talked to over a hundred, you know, really senior level people in fashion um, who all really felt, you know, 
the same way in different areas. And it, it really had so much power because I think a lot of those kinds of people had never really shared their narratives and the stories and the things that they had gone through, but also just working in so many different parts of the industry and still having to deal with so many things. And I think the realization of a lot of really senior people thought, okay, once I get to this role, like this won't happen to me anymore. Once I get, you know, to the senior level kind of, um, you know, part of a company that, you know, I won't have to deal with these things. And I think it was even crazy for me because a lot of the people, it wasn't like a lot of people were friends. Like it wasn't like, oh, like we've talked about this before. Like most of the people in that story kind of knew other people and whatever, but it was really like, we've all been having these experiences and haven't talked to each other about it and have been going through all these crazy things. And I think that it really kind of gathered this community of people to really say, you know, if we're going through this as senior level people in the industry, something's clearly wrong. And, um, you know, I think then a lot of those conversations, you know, started back up again this year with everything that's happened and really felt like it was time to kind of come up with some ideas to hold people accountable. Um, You know, I'm not a fan of cancel culture. And I think that um, obviously I think that brands need to be, you know, called out if they're doing something really crazy. But I do think that a lot of it is, about transparency and accountability that people have really, really wanted from brands. Um, And I do think that that's really kind of the baseline thinking of, okay, we want to create this, you know, corporate uh, equality index with the human rights campaign, because we can really make an industry wide standard of saying like, of course, yes, you should have a certain percentage of people, you know, working at your company or, you know, those brands represented, but where a lot of these companies struggle is putting those policies into practice and actually making people feel included because Mm -hmm. a lot of companies are kind of close to good numbers as far as being diverse um, in in some areas, but the people there don't feel included and the people there don't even feel like, you know, they're, they're supported and really feel like they're put in a position of success or that they're ever, you know, um, going to be considered for more senior roles in the company, et cetera. And so, a lot of the work that we're doing is really challenging that and saying, look, we we're going to put together an industry wide standard so so that you can actually see progress and change over the next three years and working with us Um, and really working on, yes, like, of course, you know, there are going to be a ton of front facing initiatives and programs that I'm really excited about to roll out. But um, a lot of the work is really going to be that integral foundation of what are you doing behind the scenes? We're happy to, you know, collaborate with people on, public facing things but we want that messaging and how people are feeling actually to align to make sure that people of color are feeling like they're heard and their voices are amplified you know in the office but also then yes like your your campaigns and anything that's front facing as well is inclusive yeah no and and obviously for us like you know hearing that and also hearing also not just like that you launched this but also knowing that there's a timeline to it and it's not expected to happen overnight. I think as a brand speaking, I guess like just for myself, you know, it it was really overwhelming and it continues to be overwhelming to make sure that uh, aside from just checking the boxes, but you know, are we on the right path? And like, does it have to, you know, feeling like it has to happen so immediate and to really like kind of prove to everyone that like we're acting fast and that we're doing everything that we possibly can. And, and it gets overwhelming because there are so many things that we have to do. And also so many uh, things that we have to do, right. You know, it's not just like doing it for the sake of doing it. Right. It's like really actually having like a plan. And so, yeah, I thought that the initiative is, is awesome. And I think having, you know, almost kind of like a, I don't know if it's a, you want to call it a scorecard, but kind of like a, <laughs> uh, kind of like a scorecard. Yeah. Just to, you know, check in and, and also let people know that, Hey guys, like it's going to take a long time. It's going to take three years. Um, there's a lot of different things that we have to do, but giving people a chance to really roll that out, because I think that's one thing that, you know, cancel culture and just people in general are um, want to see change so rapidly. And that, you know, sometimes I think even though companies are moving quickly, it's not fast enough. And so having people, you know, like, you know, BIFC say, you know, 
again, guys, let's, let's give everybody kind of like a second to just figure this out, I think is, uh, is really incredible. And, and we hope to be a part of it and, and also be able to share that story to our customers, our followers, to, that we are making those um, changes over the long term. Yeah, I mean, it's going to take three years. I keep telling you, it's not, it's not going to happen next year. So just chill. Like it's every company is in such a different state. And I mean, we're in a pandemic and people's financials are very different. I think that very different. Um, we're, we're working on, you know, the foundational work so that people can actually see change and, and lives will be changed. And I, and I firmly believe that. Um, but it's not going to happen overnight because good work takes a while. Absolutely. And, and good work and also like really like long-term change, I think really does take a lot of planning and people and obviously if need be uh, funding to make those changes happen. Um, so, I mean, I'll wind down to the last three questions that I've been asking all my guests in a second, but um, I just kind of want to ask, you know, closing out, you have so much going on. You've really led the charge since you wrote your award-winning um, article or essay. Um, what, what, do, what's next? Like, I feel like you're so young still. And so I'm, I, it's so um, admirable to me as a, you know, older woman um, to see you just really, you know, leading the pack and really using your voice and your platform and your, your job to make a change. And it's making me feel like, man, I have so much more to do um, in a good way. Um, so I appreciate it and, and, and thank you. But what, what more do you want to do? I mean, so many things. I, I really, I mean, I do feel like I have an incredibly niche point of view. Um, I think, you know, even just if I'm talking about myself, I mean, as, as a black woman who, you know, is a size eight and I'm not sample size and I've, you know, done all of these things. I think that you'd feel like there are still so many areas that need to move forward in fashion. And I think mm -hmm. that that's really my goal is to figure out the ways that I can make young Lindsay and young and young women of color really feel just feel good and feel part of this and feel like it's possible for them, but also feel like it's not talking down to them or not, you know, shaming them in any way. And I, I think that that work is long lasting. It, it's, it's a never ending thing, but I think, um, I mean, so, so many, so many things and, Honestly, for me, it's always like, okay, I need to just focus on just, you know, where I am right now and kind of where that's going to take me. I, I have like a lot of very big dreams and goals, which is a surprise to no one. Um, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but I am definitely trying to, I'm working on, you know, not being that kind of person that in my mind, you know, well, when I get this, it's, you know, like, I'm really trying to make sure that I'm not like glorifying that next step or that next thing that I want to do and really being grateful and grounded in what I'm doing right now and, and um, enjoying that ride. That's amazing. Well, I'm sure young Lindsay is looking at you being like, that's way more than I ever expected because uh, you are killing it. Um, okay. So to close the interview, I, again, I asked like my um, guest, Three, three, same three questions. Uh, first being, Lindsay, what is your superpower? Ooh, um, I think, a, I mean, a weird superpower is that um, I am obviously a really creative person, but I have also a very strong business mind, which I think is a really, yes. really lethal combination because I think <laughs> that, um, Go get them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, love, you know, I, I think that's it, it's that's why I think it's so fun for me to be in a role like this because I'm not that person that you know is just you know I think that sometimes we fashion people can be a little bit frivolous and a little all over and um, I know how to be scrappy I know how to make beautiful imagery but not you know spend too much and I think um, you know, understanding like how to grow a business and really how to expand and how to reach people, but also be creative in that. I think um, it's a fun superpower. Mm -hmm. No, and it's a very rare one. It's a super rare superpower to be uh, both creative and business focused and know how to run a business and know that you have to also make money at that business. Um, so that's an incredible superpower. Second question is what's the shit that no one told you? that you wish somebody did? It could be anything. 
I mean, honestly, I think um, how much money you don't make in in in. <laughs> Um, especially for me, it was like when I was working at Teen Vogue as an assistant, I had two other jobs. So I was, I was changing mannequins to the DKNY store at night when I would leave Teen Vogue. And then on the weekends I was waitressing and I definitely didn't understand like wealth and class gaps because I just grew up in a normal suburb and never wanted for anything. So I was just like, what? Like, this is crazy. I'm only getting paid $9 an hour. Like, how do I live this kind of life? And um, I think that under just the understanding of, you know, that you don't make a ton of money um, until you get to a lot of certain places, but also just the understanding of the expectations of even if you don't make a ton of money that a lot of other people are still, you know, living off of their parents or and also you're expected to be wearing certain things and appearing certain places and et cetera. And I think that that really I mean, that hit me like a train because I was like, how are people showing up in full Chanel and we're making $9 an hour? This makes no sense to me. And I think the expectations are always so high for fashion people to look good and all of those other things, but all of that costs money at the end of the day. All of it. Yeah. And I do think that that hit me like a train, but also I think hinders a lot of women of color from staying in the industry because it is so hard to stay in an industry where you're not making that much money and the pressure is really high. And so that's something that I'm, you know, consistently talking to young women of color about because I wish somebody would have, would have just broken it down to me from the beginning for sure. No, I mean, I think that that's such a good, that's such a good um, piece of, I mean, I don't know, shit (laughs) advice is to share to people because I mean, I, I, feel the same way. I tell people like the first like designer bag that I ever bought on my own was in 2015. Like that was just five years ago that I bought like my first Celine bag in New York um, because I didn't make any money either. Like having my own brand back in the day. And even when I worked at Revolve for years, like I wasn't making that much money. (laughs) So FYI guys, uh, you got to really grind it out. (laughs) Um, Okay. And then my last question is, what would be the song to your life? Hmm. Whether it's it? whether it describes it now or just kind of, you know, where you've been, where you're going. I mean, I can't think of a specific song, but I would say anything from Beyonce's homecoming album is a pretty good description. Um you know, we, we bow down to Beyonce. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I always, I I mean, I personally just really admire how much of a hustler she is. I'm a fan of her music, but I think that she's like one of the most hardworking people on the planet. And, um, I think always like listening to that album, um, you know, watching on Netflix always like really inspires me and gets me amped up again. So. Yeah, same. Well, thank you. So, I'm P.S. Also, I'm a giant Beyonce fan. And she's always doing something to not just like reinvent herself, but also ensure that her people and are taken care of. And it's, it's honestly, yeah. it's incredible. Um, well, Lindsay, thank you so much. This was such an awesome conversation. I've learned so much, not just about you, but just how we as a brand and me as a you know, I guess a person at the table can continue to do more. So I really appreciate your time and thank you so much. Of course.